Um, hi, everybody. Be before um, Rob introduces the session, I just wanted to speak for uh, just a, a minute or two. Um, it's really good that the, the, the next session will, will have um, um, both um, Emery Brown and, and, and Alison Cole. Um, and I, I just wanted to make specific points of thanks. And the specific points of thanks are that, for those of you who don't know, um, this meeting has been supported by a generous grant from the um, NIGMS. It's, it's an R13 grant. And this is the, the second of, of three meetings that uh, the grant is supporting. The uh, next one will be at uh, the ASA meeting uh, next year. And um, I'm not going to be introducing the speakers, but just thanking both of them specifically. Um, Alison, who's been a great friend to anesthesiology and really advocates for us as a specialty, has done that consistently over many, many years and um, is very enthusiastic about the energy of this group of people. And um, Emery, who's, who's been a great, um, I hope you won't mind me saying this, friend and mentor to me, um, Emery is probably um, one of the most um, um, successful and um, generous mentors in our field. And as such, I think it's entirely appropriate that um, as a member of the IARS, IARS board, he is um, the person who was selected by ESAS to, to participate in, in the next session. So thank you very much to the NIGMS, to the NIH, for the kind support that it's provided to us um, for, for launching what we are hoping to embark on as, as something long-term. And, and huge congratulations to ESAS. All of, all of the organizational work has been done by ESAS, by the ESAS membership, leadership, and, and you've really um, elevated uh, this, this meeting through your work. So big, big congrats. So just while they're getting everything set up, uh, my name's Rob Freundlich. I'm the Southern Regional Representative for the Early Stage Anesthesia Scholars. I'm uh, an assistant professor at Vanderbilt. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Emery Brown. Uh, Emery Brown is the Edward Hood Taplin Professor of Medical Engineering and Computational Neuroscience at MIT. He's also the Warren Zapol Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and a practicing anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's an anesthesiologist statistician whose experimental research has made important contributions to understanding the neurophysiology of how anesthetics act in the brain to create the states of general anesthesia. His statistics research has developed signal processing algorithms to study dynamic processes in neuroscience. He's also one of 21 people who's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Engineering.
Great, so thank you so much. Thanks, Michael, for the opportunity to, to, to speak to you all. And uh, so I, I thought I would try to make this extremely practical. You know, what, what should you think about in terms of your research careers? And, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> What, what, what should you think about in terms of your research careers? And um, so these are some of my funding sources, and the, I just point out that we do have this relationship with Massimo. Um, so I'm going to do this as a series of questions. I'm going to do a series of questions, and then I'm going to do a case study, and then to basically apply the, question, the answers to the questions. So I think in beginning, what you should do is I think you should, you know, like chill out, and, and ask yourself, what are the big questions in anesthesia, right? And, and I just put these up there. I'm not saying these are the big questions. I just put down some examples of some things that we talk about, like uh, post-operative cognitive function. Everybody, you know, talks about that now. It's a big issue. Is there something I can do? Do I have some specific insights that may be useful for solving that problem? ARAS, you know, I, you know, I'm in the hospital every Tuesday. I came to the hospital one Tuesday, and I found out, oh, we're doing ARAS now. I, okay, well, so, okay, I guess I better learn about ARAS, all right? You know, so obviously important. And then I found out there's a whole big structure. It's not going to be in, only in our hospital, but it's going to be in every hospital in like our whole partner's network. Okay, I guess I missed something, all right? <laughs> Neurotoxicity of anesthetics, you know, we, we hear about it a lot. And, and like today, this morning, we heard Jeff Balzer talk about, you know, big data, you know, anesthesiology. Are these, you know, again, so I think, to me, this is like the really, really fun part where you sit back and you say, hmm, what are some of the, what are some of the big issues? And it, here's, here's the part which I think goes with this. I would say, question the obvious things we do, right? We do everything the same way, right? Induction is always done with a hypnotic. It wasn't always done with a hypnotic. We used to breathe people down all the time, right? But so, you know, maybe there's something there. And actually, just think about one thing. I'll just plant one idea with you, right? You could anesthetize someone completely if you're not using muscle relaxants, have them breathing on their own with just an inhale drug. So you don't have to stop. You don't have to have, you do not have to have apnea when you have anesthesia, right? So, so I mean, these are things that we don't even think about anymore. But again, if you start just questioning, I mean, you measure muscle relaxation by train of four. You know, I had the good fortune to work with Hassan Ali, you know, who, who came up with this idea. It was like phenomenal to be able to do that. But does it have to be done that way? Oh, the cables in the OR? Come on, right. <laughs> in the day of the iPhone, we have cables in the OR like that? Totally ridiculous, right? Totally, totally. I mean, so I'm just saying, these things are sitting right in front of us. We don't question, we just, okay, I know how to organize my cables. Look, I use ties and stuff, and you know, we, we developed this thing called a NAT rack, so you could arrange all the, all the IV bags and everything, and, and like for the cardiac cases or the big thoracic cases, and it still takes the better part of 20 minutes to get everything all set. I mean, so again, and then again, we all, you know, muscle relaxation is always provided by anticholinergic drugs, all right? So then, again, staying on a high level, can you, this is a bit of a personal thing, you know, picking a topic which I think is relevant to anesthesiology. For a number of years, we've been very, very good at picking topics outside of anesthesiology. And it's because they're there, they're bigger than us, right? And then, you know, we'll take topics and say, well, let me, well, stem cells are there, let me just give them some anesthesia and see what happens, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean be, be, because you can, right? I mean, but, but you know, that's maybe, you know, but I mean, let's ask a question that's going to make anesthesiology better as opposed to asking a question of something we can do. And, and, I, and I think that we, we really, I just feel we don't do this enough. And then realizing, again, so the, the fourth topic is, New technologies, like what's happening? Again, there's so much being talked about about machine learning. Optogenetics is like one of the biggest things. I could have put CRISPR up here, for example. You know, educating ourselves about some of the new ideas. But again, my bias is, all right, how can I use these new ideas to help me answer a very salient question in the field of anesthesiology? You know, organ on a chip, all these, you know, you know new imaging ideas, all right? And then, you know, something which has been like a theme here, you know, with these sessions, like, who are the correct mentors? 
And I think here you really have to think broadly. And this is like a fact-finding mission. It's like asking questions. And I've been learning a little bit about this now as I've gotten involved in some commercial endeavors. And, you know, it's something I don't know that much about. But everybody I come in contact with, if there's any hint that they have some idea about how to, how to run a startup or how to manage a business, you know, I talk to them. I get information. And I think that's what you really have to do. You really have to do your due diligence. Your department, your hospital, university, your town, elsewhere. I mean, I, I, I literally, you know, get letters from like all over, people asking me questions. Would you be willing to advise me on A? Or do you think B would work? Or, and so I think given how connected we are in the world, you shouldn't feel like your mentors or your collaborators necessarily have to be those people who sit like in your department. I think that's one of the things that really, really limits us. And I can run the same list for collaborators as well. And it's probably even more important in terms of collaborators. Because everything you need will not be right in your department. It won't be right in your hospital. It won't be right, you know, in your, it won't be right in your university. And, and here's the part where, which is both fun and also maybe a little bit unnerving, right? You may have to get some additional training. And because probably if you're thinking, if you're really thinking out of the box, you really find a cool question, you're going to have to, you know, learn something new. But that's all part of becoming, you know, a, um, a researcher who's working on the cutting edge because of everything you're, you know, if you're going to, you know, like determine whether one muscle relaxant is faster than the other, you're going to use standard train of form monitoring. Uh, there's not too much more to learn, right? I mean, that, you know, we, that, that was done, you know, 20, 30 plus years ago. But these are some of the things which come up. Laboratory techniques, being formally trained in clinical research, you know, statistics, it's always an Achilles heel for most of us, and also imaging. You know, these are just some, some of the ideas of some of the topics. And then the final thing here, so the final thing is thinking about uh, how you're going to fund this, right? It's great to have the ideas. And, and here's where, you know, I put a little bit more of the responsibility, not so much on you all, but, you know, on those of us who are sort of in my cohort or certainly people who run departments or, I, I just think we have to be willing to generate internal funds because I don't know of any sort of, you know, cool new project that started because the person just showed up and had all the resources. Somebody has to give you some time out of the OR, they have to give you some funds to basically get going. There's no two ways about that. So. I was at Berkeley um, on Wednesday, and I was talking with one of my colleagues there, Jose Carmina. And uh, one of the things that they just set up at Berkeley, this is, in, this is for the university, it has, it's not in anesthesiology, it's just drawing an analogy, is they've set up these fellowships called Baker Fellowships at Berkeley. And the idea behind a Baker Fellowship is to really encourage uh, faculty members there to have the money that they need to bridge the gap between having an idea and then trying to start new with it and take it out to commercialize it or this sort of thing, right? So these, and so in a lot of places, like we've done this too, like in my institute that I'm part of at MIT, we have these startup fellowships. They can range from $50,000 to $200,000, $250,000, but the idea is to have some funds so you can get going. And, I th and again, this, this part of it really isn't so much for you all, but for you know, those of us who are running departments, I think we have to make these sorts of resources that, you know, available so that ideas can get off the ground, because without it, they just won't start. And then thinking about you know, foundations, you know, the, the, um, you know, Allison is going to tell us in detail about NI, you know, NIH, but then these other sources, and then as things start to look sort of a bit more commercial, you know, venture capital, these are very, very real sources of of funding. There's certain, there's certain criteria that you have to meet in order to have conversations with these individuals, but nevertheless, it's, if you don't think about it, you won't look for it. Let me just put it that way, all right? So now for the case study. So here's my case study, Ken saw it, <laughs> all right? So, 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 so Ken did this a few years ago. And I got his, he didn't just leave because I was going to do this. He, he, had to, he actually had to go moderate a session, you know, but he, he planned to be here. But I asked him if I could use him as a case study. All right, he said it was all right. All right. So, so I mean, Ken is like, you know, phenomenal with a capital fee. I mean, I, 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 think, he's, I think he's outstanding. And so, um, again, 
question the obvious things we do. So we always let people come too from anesthesia, right? So why not wake them up, right? So, and I remember, you know, when Ken and I first started talking about this, and we would tell some people about this, go, oh, you wake them up, you might make them more delirious and stuff. Or why would you want to do that? I remember one guy telling us that, you know, the drugs work fine already. Why are you so concerned about that? All right, so that's one of the things you're going to find out. You come up with a new idea. As you've heard, everybody's going to tell you why it doesn't work. Okay, you can't listen to yourself. This is your inner voice. You know, you have to listen to that. You've thought about this. They haven't. But it's like, okay. And the more people are saying, it's actually even better than that, you know. The more people are saying, like, uh, you know, that's going against the grain, I go. And they go, that won't work, I go. <laughs> Fantastic, right? I'm glad, I'm glad you see it that way. All right, so, 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 so what, did, what did Ken do? So he asked the, he, 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 he after looking at this in, in a lot of detail, and, and actually parenthetically, I was just talking with Angela a second ago, we were talking about delayed emergence. So we were in the operating room, and we had a delayed emergence, and uh, so we thought, oh, delayed emergence, you know, let's get some drug and see if we can try to wake the patient up. So we got caffeine. Sorry, Giancarlo, but it doesn't work for waking you up from anesthesia, right? It, it, it might help with, uh, with, with sleep deprivation, but it doesn't wake you up from anesthesia. And we pulled off the class, we tried the physostigmine. It didn't work. You know, the guy was still there. And if you've ever tried this, the, the, the systemic side effects of, are, are, are very profound. Let me just put it that way. All right. And, and you, you do not make friends with the nursing staff when you, when you do that, all right? So it, 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 just, it just didn't work. And this is what's in the books. You read this. This is what you're supposed to do. So scratching his head, doing some research, he came up with some other ideas. And one of his ideas was to try Ritalin. So methylphenidate, you know, could you, you know, wake people up with that. So this is the ideas that he came up with, you know, setting up a rodent model for this, coming up with a way of thinking about it, being specific. And then, you know, not just, and then this is like, as we talked about this, you know, we agreed, like, who cares if you can wake up a rat? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't count. So really think about pushing it so you can actually do it in humans. And so he was, he was totally down for it, right? So, but then, What's the additional training? What are the technologies? What are the mentor? Who are the mentors and who are the collaborators? So again, this is where we just happen to have a fortunate set of circumstances. There are a lot of resources which are in a very short span at location. So optogenetics, so Ed Boyden just happens to be one of the inventors of optogenetics. He just happens to be at MIT, happens to be in the same institute where I am. And then my longstanding colleague, um, Matt Wilson, who's an expert neurophysiologist, who you know, helped him with his training, in particular, Krista Van Dort, who was a colleague of Giancarlo's out at uh, Michigan, who joined our group. So we had um, you know, neurophys expertise. And then, so for the behavioral studies, Ken actually went out to San Diego, spent a month and a half out there with Pam Reinigel, because she had these new, um, she had these new behavioral techniques. Because what we wanted to do, um, he, he actually, you know, he said, I want to do something different from just um, having the rat turn over, you know? you know? So he turns over, so what? Who cares, right? I want, I want to have a behavioral paradigm where it actually shows that he's actually functioning cognitively because that's the sort of thing that's going to map into things that people are going to agree, yes, this may work in humans because now the person, I can see that his brain is working, all right? And then at the same time, though, so he goes and spends six months in, California, trains and learns that. Then when he comes back, you know, we've said, well, you know, you want to be able to do the clinical study too. So he takes the clinical studies program at Harvard, you know. So now, one of the things you have to realize is this is where, again, the departments really, really matter. You can't do this unless your department chair is helping you out. This will not happen, right? And so again, we can have all these planning sessions we want, but if our academic leaders are not supporting us, none of this will occur. And obviously he got tremendous support from initially from Warren Zapol and then from Janine, who was like one of his one of his biggest fans. And then the other thing which I'll put down there is it's never too late, it's never too early to think about intellectual property. Because 
The bottom line is, if you're coming up with new ideas and you don't have some way to get them out there to patients, right? And intellectual property is one of the most compelling ways to do that. It's just going to be a great idea. It's going to die in the valley of death. So it's never too early to, to think about that. All right. So what do you do for the initial funding? It came from the department. We were very lucky. The department was quite generous. You know, Janine gave him the time, gave him, you know, the funds to basically get going because this was an idea and, you know, Ken was changing, you know, changing his path. And you've probably seen this video before, but I just, I just have to show it because I think it's so cool. Because, you know, so this is, this may not work because I didn't check it beforehand. Oh, it's good. All right, so there's one of his rat volunteers, right? So, so, so he, he's anesthetized and he's going to get, he's going to get Ivy Ritalin here into his tail vein, all right? And I just want to, so, so this was some, Ken set this whole thing up, you know, this wasn't what he was working on before. And, you know, the, the rat's going to come too as soon as he gives him the riddle and flushes it in, right? He was anesthetized there with, with isoflurane, all right? And, you know, and so this is using like the kind of the standard paradigm, just, you know, behaviorally seeing if the, there's a change. Remember, the isoflurane is still going on, and eventually, you know, the rat's going to turn over, right? It, it'll, it takes him a second or two because his feet are caught in the wires, but he's going to turn over. So this is just, you know, trying the idea out. Right, and so this suggests that you know it may be, you know it may be quite plausible. All right, keep keep. He does make it. Come on, come on, guys. All right, so, 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 right. All right. Come on, dude. All right. All right. So, okay, he made it. All right. All right. So so all right. So so that th I'm showing you this because this is the standard paradigm. You know, writing reflex, behavior response. I mean, come on, that's a reflex, right? It's called the writing reflex, right? It's not the writing cognitive reflex, right? So, and, and so what has he really shown? So you, you, we saw him come too, but this is just to show you what kind of study can design when he combined this idea of really developing something which is precisely going to activate some brain circuits and then having a behavioral paradigm that really showed you that the animal was in a state where it was functional again. So what he did next was he trained the rats to execute a behavioral task. So what the rat does is he goes here and he pokes the right thing on the wall and he turns around and he'll get a food reward. All right? So then he does that again. All right? And so, so he anesthetizes the animal and when the animal wakes up he's supposed to go back to work. Now the way he wakes him up though is he's going to stimulate his ventral tegmental area. So this is the area that's producing, you know, dopamine. It's sort of this pathway that, let's say, the Ritalin is working on, all right? So he's going to do that. And then his animal's going to work for a while. He's not going to turn the anesthesia off. When he turns the stimulation off, the animal's going to go out again, all right? So I'm just going to show this. So here is, I think this. So this is the animal anesthetized there. There's no stimulation. Let's say sedated, right, to be fair, because he's, he's not, it's not like um, he's profoundly anesthetized. So what Ken is going to do, he's going to turn the stimulation on, not turn the acid fluorine on. And so here he comes in, he stimulates at 40 hertz, and the animal gets up. So he looks, he looks for the food first. See, there's no free lunch, right? So now he turns around. He hits the right light there. Remember, the anesthesia is still on. Turns around, right? Now he turns around again. Hits the correct light. A little wobbly, but he's functioning. So this seems like he's, he's not just turning over, but he's cognitively active in some sense, right? But now he, hits, he gets the wrong one. Right, so that tells me he got it wrong, right? And so now, remember the anesthesia is still on. What Ken is going to do, he's going to turn the, he's going to turn the stimulation off, right? And now the animal's out again. All right. So, so he he's he's manipulating these circuits, and and but he's showing you a behavioral a behavioral task which is more credible in terms of whether or not giving stimulation or activating these circuits would suggest that you could perhaps function after after anesthesia. And then just quickly, the anatomy that he's taking advantage of is this anatomy here. So when you give dopamine, it blocks the reuptake of 
when you give, I'm sorry, when you give Ritalin, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. It has a few other effects too, but let's just say that's what it is for this, for this uh, discussion. And so it's in this ventral tegmental, this mesocortical pathway coming from the midbrain there out to the midbrain here, going out past the limbic system up to the cortex. And then here, and the work that, that Ken has done, he was stimulating optogenetically, and then Norm did the studies in which he also, uh, uh, he was stimulating electrically, and then Norm Taylor did studies where he actually activated this pathway optogenetically, demonstrating that you could do this, that it's, it is dopamine. So he's getting clean science, he's got something which can seemingly work clinically. So a very solid basis. So I was at, uh, I was at Vertex Pharmaceuticals a few weeks ago, I was talking with uh, their chief scientific officer, and he said the one thing which they're really trying to do there is making sure there's a very direct link between human biology, or what we used to call physiology, and whatever it is they're doing from an experimental standpoint. They just don't want to have targets just for targets sake, right? And I think that this is what's happening here. I think the reason this has potential is that the link between the human biology and the circuits is, is fairly clear. And then, or robust, I should say. And then, you know, Ken has been very successful over the last several years, you know, getting this work out there, experimental work, and he's in the midst right now of finishing up his clinical trial, so he's done a phase one trial, and literally just two days ago, he finished the phase two randomized trial, so he should be reporting on that, hopefully sometime this summer. And the idea is he's tested this out, you know, in humans. So what's happened subsequently? So he's gone on to get additional funding as part of a couple of large projects, McDonald Foundation Award, and this is again one of these awards where people are willing to take a risk on somebody young to try out a cool new idea. He set up a research team. I've just listed a few of the folks here who've helped him out. You know, a research assistant and Norm has been like a real stalwart on, particularly on the latter experiments, the opigenetic experiments, along with Krista, you know, Krista Van Dort. But the whole idea is that now this turns into something which is a really, really um, sort of solid, I think, fundable idea. But he also automatically starts becoming a mentor himself because he has to help these people along. And so it, it's just, the, it's the, you're part of a continuum, I guess, is, is the, the comment I would make. And again, I'll just leave you with one sort of uh, final idea here. It, it's never too late to think about the intellectual property. I think that if there was one thing that, you know, I, you know, I've learned, I think, you know, Ken has learned throughout this, is that there, there's, there's a big hurdle to get something out there to patients that really changes practice. It's one thing to do science and then to come through with an idea which seems plausible you can write papers about. But if you want to find something that's going to change practice, it has to get out to patients, which means you will have to be involved in some way with companies in one place or the other. And, you know, you'll feel much better about it if your ideas are protected intellectually so that, you, you know, you really continue to have the incentive to want to contribute and make those ideas be useful for patients. All right. So I'll stop there. Thanks. And our next speaker is Dr. Allison Cole. Uh, Dr. Cole is the Branch Chief of Pharmacology and Physi Physiological Sciences Branch at the Division of Pharmacology, Physiology, and Biological Chemistry at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Um, Dr. Cole handles portfolios in research for K and training grants in anesthesia and perioperative pain research. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Well, good afternoon. Uh, kudos to all of you for sticking around. This is really amazing after lunch to have so many people still awake and alert. And uh, I want to thank the organizers. Um, this session is um, 
gets better and better every year, and I think uh, today has just been terrific. I think uh, you all really have been uh, exposed to a lot of great talks and really incredibly useful information. So um, look forward to many more years of uh, the ESAS Scholars Program. So I, I am, I think what I'm gonna contribute today to this conversation is maybe talk a little bit about how NIH establishes research priorities, how you can find out about those, how that can maybe inform you about um, the research you might wanna do or not. Um, so I'm also gonna stick in a little bit about um, NIH and some very basic stuff just to help you as new investigators kind of navigate um, this monstrosity that is NIH and kind of who to talk to there and when and you know what kind of uh, topics. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, research priorities. So um, we tend to think of NIH uh, as this big behemoth, this big monolithic structure that's our big clinical center in Bethesda. Um, but in fact, uh, we're a very complicated bureaucracy and we're made up of 24 uh, funding institutes all split up by um, you know, the scientific area, disease, uh, uh, lifespan stage. And then there are also these three uh, separate parts of NIH that don't have funding authority. So the 24 institutes are where the money comes from. That's where you apply to um, to get your grant funded. But the most, um, the important one down below there is the Center for Scientific Review. And so there's often confusion uh, that, uh, for example, NIGMS over here with a little red bar around it, you know, that we somehow, uh, the SAT, surgery, anesthesiology, and study section is part of us. It's not. Those are two separate entities. And I'll talk a little bit um, more about how these decisions are made, but it's important for you to realize that. And it's good to know that there are all these different institutes, they have different missions, they have different um, grants they offer, they have different eligibility criteria for certain things. So you do need to be a little strategic when you start thinking about where you wanna send your grant and I'll talk a little bit about how to get some help doing that. So the Center for Scientific Review, that's really the gateway into NIH. So every application that comes to NIH goes through the Center for Scientific Review. And um, that's where the majority of, when you think about study sections like SAT, those are housed within the Center for Scientific Review. Not in my institute, not in NCI, they're in the Center for Scientific Review, and they actually review about 75% of all the applications come in. And we're now something like 50,000 applications a year. You wonder why success rates aren't great? Ew, a lot of competition. <laughs> so. Um, so here's kind of the journey of, your, of your, your, your application. You're sitting out here at your institution. Um, just as an aside, I've used this slide for many years with Albert Einstein there, and I thought, you know, it's 2018. We need a little gender equity. Does anybody recognize the, the woman? I, I hope I get a little better response than Peter got this morning with his, uh, <laughs> you know, name that person. Anybody know? This is Barbara McGlintock, who was the first woman to solely get a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. So, you know, go her um, for tra gene transposition. So anyway, I've, I've revised my slide now going forward. It will stay this way. So anyway, you're out here doing all your brilliant things, coming up with wonderful ideas, and you send in an application. And it goes, as I said, to the Center for Scientific Review. And they make two simultaneous decisions at that point. And one is which institute, like NIGMS, would be the most appropriate for the science that you're proposing. And then they make a separate independent decision which study section is in, in CSR would be most appropriate. Now there are some caveats I won't go into. Things are much more complicated than that, but by and large, that's how it, how it works. So when people call me and they, you know, and they complain that your, your study section, SAT, you know, that, 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 it's like, no, SAT, Center for Scientific Review, independent from NIH. And in fact, there's a very deliberate separation of program and review at NIH to try to keep things, um, you know, very, very clean and separate. So um, it gets assigned to a study section. They generate, you know, that's where peer review occurs. They generate a summary statement which has your critiques in it. 
I also get a copy of that summary statement. And um, then things go well, goes through our advisory council, which is the, set we call it the second level of peer review. And everything goes great, you get the money, and, and everybody lives happily ever after, till your renewal. And um, so, so here's uh, just kind of a little quick schematic about who you contact at what point in the process. And so when you're out there coming up with ideas, you want to know if this is something the institute's interested in, or which institute, which study section. At that point, you would contact someone like myself, a program director in the institute, to see if that institute would you know, accept that application or is interested in that area of science. But you can, at that point, also talk to the scientific review officer who runs the study section. So um, both of us have information that we could share with you at that point. Once it's submitted, right up until the day it's reviewed, then you're pretty much talking to the SRO, the Scientific Review Administrator. They are the one, if you have some late material you might want to submit, or you have questions about the review process, or um, things related directly to review, they're the ones you would talk to. Uh, after it's reviewed, pretty much the day it's uh, reviewed, after that, then you'd be back talking to the program officer. And um, we'd be the one, well, actually I have another slide that says the sort of things you can talk to with us. But um, the w one thing I do want to mention, and it's kind of based on some of the th things we've been hearing today, you know, the, the program directors, the program officers, you know, we're, we're people. We, we, we have families, we have struggles. Um, just like all of you. So I do tell people when I give a, you know, a new grant, I'm like, you know, contact me. If there's anything that's going on with you, it can be professionally or personally, that's going to impact, potentially impact your, your K or your, your, your R01 or whatever. You know, let me know. And sometimes there's actually things we can do um, to maybe help. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it never hurts to let us know what's going on. So, so here's some of the things you could talk to a, a program officer about. Before submission, it'd be obviously things like, is, is my topic a good fit for your institute? Um, you know, is it something your institute's excited about or do you have a hundred other applications and grants on that right now and you're getting kind of tired of that topic? Um, you know, institutes are all, there's always things sort of in the works that might not be out there yet and, you know, talk with a program officer might give you a heads up about things that are coming. Um, grant mechanisms, um, and we can certainly talk to you about study sections as well. After review, then it usually would focus on the summary statement, um, you know, there's all these critiques, which ones do I focus on, how do I submit it, you know, an amended application. Um, or, you know, what's the funding, what does this score mean? You get this score out of context and it's like, am I getting funded or is there no hope, what's going on? And if, if not funded, then you know, kind of what are next steps? So lots of things we can talk about. And realize this is part of our job. I mean, you're not like taking me away from other more important things when you call me. Um, so so you, know, you don't have to start off your call saying, Dr. Cole, I'm really sorry to bother you, but. So, but there are a few tips for, for when you are working with us and calling people at NIH. First of all, you know, be prepared. I mean, do a little homework. Try to, try to find the answer to your question on your own if you can. And there are some resources I'll tell you about where you can do some of that now. Um, be timely. Um, I really hate it when people call the day before the review, their grants getting reviewed and say, I think it's going to the wrong study section. There's nothing we can do at that point. But if you had called me soon after it got assigned and truly you know, we have a discussion or you contact CSR actually at that point, things can happen. Applications can be moved uh, if CSR agrees with, with that. So um, timeliness is important. Uh, and be specific with your questions. I mean, often people call with specific questions and then it segues to a much uh, broader discussion. So that's fine too. And, and what I find works best is to, you know, send me an email, and if it's about, you know, is my grant appropriate for your institute, uh, a couple of sentences about the work, if you've got an abstract, you can send that. 
that gives me something solid to look at. I can think about it a little more. And you know, if it's not appropriate for us, I can look into where maybe it, it should go. And then you know, if a phone call is needed, we'll follow up with a phone call and schedule that. Uh, now, there's, there's some resources I'll tell you about. I hope most of you know about the NIH Reporter. Um, this is a, just a rich, rich uh, database of all funded grants at NIH going back many years. And so I, I often send you know, young investigators to this to look up you know, what's already funded in your area. I mean, you can do a, a search on you know, terms, and I'll show you some other new tools as well. Um, it'll tell you, you know, which institute at NIH has been funding that kind of research. Um, you know, might give you idea about the potential collaborators and success rates. I mean, there's just tons and tons of information here, um, and it's worth, you know, going in and playing with it and, and getting familiar with it. Um, so one of the newest tools, which, you know, I use this myself all the time. It's called Matchmaker, and when you go into Reporter, you can see there's a tab there. Uh, and it's got this 15,000 character um, entry point. You can put a whole abstract, a whole specific games page. And what it will tell you, it reads out like this, where you can see which institute um, you know, funds most of the grants in that area. Now I put in, uh, I put in burn injury, you know, just a little short, very targeted search. Um, but like I said, it's more tickled to go and put your whole abstract in or something like that. But you can see it shows NIGMS is the you know, largest funder of burn injury applications, uh, grants at NIH, which makes sense. We have a burn injury portfolio. Um, it also shows you, you know, the, what kind of grants primarily are in that area. It's, you can see it's R01s. But the other good information, it'll show you which study sections are um, is, are these applications primarily reviewed in? You can see SAT, surgery, anesthesiology, and trauma reviews most of them. And you'll also get a printout of all the, the grants um, in that area and, uh, again, loaded with information. Now, the other thing that's very handy is you can also click on the tab for program official, and it'll now tell you all the program officers at NIH who work in the burn injury area or have some, I guess it's really showing you program officials who have funded grants that relate to burn injury. And again, at the top of the list is my colleague Scott Summers who has, handles the burn injury portfolio. So I'm happy to see he actually came to the top of the list. And it gives you the, the contact information. You can click on that and you can get the, uh, uh, an email sent off to Scott. So trying to identify who to talk to at NIH is much easier than it used to be. And it used to be, you know, you kind of ask your colleagues, you know, who do you talk to there? And um, you some might start with one person and, you know, work your way finally maybe to the right person. But this is, saves a lot of time and it's really a, a nice tool. So switching gears a bit, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how does NIH set their priorities? And, um, you know, all of the institutes set their own priorities, and NIH Central has their way of setting priorities as well. And there's a lot of ways we get input in, into, into doing this. The biggest, the most, you know, important one is really the scientific community. We come to meetings like this, we listen to scientific talks, we talk to our grantees, we talk to applicants. Um, we have members from scientific societies come to our institute and talk to us and let us know what's going on and what their needs are, where the scientific gaps might be. Uh, so that, I would say, is by large the, the main source of input. Now, we can't forget Congress. Um, they're very important in all of this as well, and they, in fact, do um, set the appropriation and the budget for NIH. Uh, and and um, they can set priorities or in, instruct us in, in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's just language that's in the appropriation bill. You know, we think, you know, maybe you should kind of think about this or you know, do more in this area. Uh, what we like the best is when they say things like that but actually give us money to do it. And that's less common, but for example, 
For example, this year, you, if you've been reading and paying attention to it, um, we did get money for the opiate, uh, opiate, uh, uh, the opioid crisis and research related to that as well as for Alzheimer's research. So um, there are opportunities there right now in those areas. Um, and then uh, third, you know, there's a lot of other places, pe people from industry, um, patient advocacy groups, public representatives. These people come and serve on our advisory panels, and so we're always hearing from them as well, and they offer, you know, another perspective. Um, so, so those are, I would say, by and large, the main sources uh, uh, of input that we use to think about our own priorities. So how do you find out about this? Um, you know, the, I mean, the simplest way is if we develop an area that we want to see, uh, if we have an area we want to see developed, we issue funding opportunity announcements. And that's our way of saying, here's an area, please send in an application. And those are usually as a program announcement or an RFA, a request for application. I won't get into how those are different. but. Um, now these, whenever one of these comes out, it is posted in the NIH Guide for Grants and Contracts. You can subscribe to that. Um, if you have a good grants office, they should be kind of monitoring these things as well, and they might uh, have ways of informing uh, their, their uh, investigators at, the, at their institution. Um, but you can subscribe yourself. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's generally not relevant, there's lots of policy changes, there's lots of kind of administrative minutia, but buried in there could be an opportunity for you that might be useful. Now, every one of those 24 institutes has a website. Now, obviously, you can't be monitoring 24 institutes' websites, um, and, but, but some of us have blogs where we, you know, you can subscribe to them and Anytime we have something, an opportunity coming up, like right now, there's some money for uh, equipment supplements for our current grantees. You know, that's, in our, that's in our blog. It is not being done as a special program announcement, so the only way you'd know about it was through the NIH guide, where it was announced, and through our, our blog. So that's worth um, subscribing to. So you, I mean, you have to strategically figure out which institutes, multiple institutes, might be most relevant to you, and maybe kind of keep an eye on either their blogs or their website. Um, now, there is a way to get an early peek at initiatives that might be coming from the institutes, and that's to uh, uh, read the minutes for the advisory council. Any initiative that we're going to issue, a new program announcement or an RFA, has to get cleared by our advisory councils. And so there's a process for that, and it has to get written up in the minutes. And they're public record, and they're on our websites, and they're actually really easy to find. And if you read through them, you can see um, something called a concept clearance. So here's an example of one I took from NINDS. And this came out last year, and this happened to be in this topic of neurobiology of small uh, blood and lymphatic vessels. But you probably can't, you know, this type is too small, but what it does is it identifies a program person who has presented this initiative to council and it says a very little bit about it, but down here it says two funding announcements were proposed for publication in mid-October. So council approved these. So what this tells you is here it is May and there's going to be some program announcement coming out on this in October. You're getting like five months head, heads up on something that's coming. Now, if this isn't in your area, obviously you ignore it, but if it's a topic you know, that's relevant to you, you can contact this program person now. This is now out there, public record, and ask her, you know, what are you, what's the plan? You know, tell me anything about these uh, announcements that are going to be coming out. Now, Emery did a much better job on this than I could ever do, so this was good, good that I followed you, Emery. Um, but just a little bit about selecting a project sort of with NIH in mind. So we've talked about NIH um, requested research. In other words, when we issue things and say, please send us applications in this area, and I, you know, program announcements, RFAs, we have strategic plans you can read about and um, other announcements. 
But actually, the majority of research and a majority of applications that come to NIH are investigator-initiated. It means it's nothing we put out there to say apply to. It's just you having a great idea and sending it in to us. So, you know, there doesn't have to be a, a program announcement or an RFA out there for you to submit your work. And the majority, like I said, comes in this way. And you've heard this before, and I think this is really important. Find what research excites you. You know, when you write an application, really what you're trying to do is get the reviewers excited about your topic and your research. And believe me, if you're not excited about it, it's going to come across in your application and the reviewers are not going to be excited about it. Um, and I think this was already mentioned um, by s several of the speakers. Really think about the gaps that exist in your specialty. And, you know, Emery pointed out some great ideas about identifying, you know, just things that are sort of standard and, and you know, you do sort of automatically. That kind of a clue for, you know, where are their needs? And um, coming to meetings like this, you know, you get a lot of ideas. And what, certainly from the reviewer perspective, they're really looking for work that's going to move the field forward. That's what they, they care about. They're looking for impact. Now, that can be in basic science. It, it doesn't have to have immediate clinical impact, but it needs to have impact in your field and, and somehow moving it forward. Um, so these are just a few of the resources that really is you know, we're all busy people. You guys are super busy trying to balance research and, and clinical. But there are a lot of resources out there for you, and some of them are very quick. You don't have to spend a lot of time. Um, the Center for Scientific Review has got a, a nice quick little video about the review process. I think the more you know about it, the more effective you can be writing an application. Um, the Office of Extramural Research goes step by step through a lot of the application process. And I, I send people um, a lot to this site. Um, NIAID Allergy and Infectious Disease really puts a lot of energy into maintaining a really terrific grants tutorial website. And they go through everything. I mean, you know, how to write your specific AIMS page. They have sample applications for you to look at. Um, how do you plan a budget and your personnel? So uh, I, I really recommend that site, uh, especially if you're, well, really at any time. Anybody can benefit this. It's really, really well done. And um, so I think there are a lot of resources, but probably at NIH your best resource is, is the people. I mean, I spend a lot of time on the phone with especially new investigators, because you have a lot to learn. And it's, you know, there are great resources, but ultimately it really helps to talk to somebody, you know, on the inside who can, you know, help you be more effective in, in submitting your applications and getting those precious K awards and, and research grants. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? All right, Liz? Okay. I, have a, I have a quick question. I was hoping Dr. Cole could comment on the early career reviewer program that the NIH does. For right. The oh, thank you for bringing that up. So, again, not that you're not all really, really busy, but, you know, there's nothing like getting hands-on experience. and. Um, CSR started a, a program a number of years ago where they uh, invite young investigators. Uh, I'm trying to think what the requirement is. If you, you don't, I don't think you, I'm trying to think, maybe you do have to have an R01. No, you don't have to have an R01, right. Um, to come on, to sit on the review panel, you have a very minimal review load, and it's just for the one round. So um, you can self-nominate if you go to the CSR website, just um, early stage investigator, CSR early stage investigator, um, you'll, you'll go right to it. And you can nominate yourself or other people can nominate you. Uh, it's, it is very competitive because I think people have realized this is a really nice program and you learn so much from sitting there and listening to you know, experienced investigators review grants. Um, 
we're also starting at our institute a, a early stage investigator on our council. Now that you do have to have an R01, but you're like an ESI, an early stage investigator, like you just got your R01 to come and see what happens to grants after the you know the peer review. What's that next stage of review? So I think NIH is trying to engage young investigators more uh, and give you opportunities. So um, definitely, th thanks for bringing that up. That's that's a nice program. Jim. Yeah. Uh, quick question for Dr. Cole um, regarding. Uh, the suggestion that you had of if you wanted to, if you think your study has been malassigned to a study section, uh, explicitly, how do you, how do you, what is, we're all weary of potentially inflaming somebody by saying <laughs> the wrong thing to an SRO, right? Right, you know, so, right, right. Um, how exactly do you think we should approach that? Uh, it seems like, you know, with anesthesiology, oh, this is from the Department of Anesthesiology, this goes to SAT, right? You know, um, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, not necessarily, right, but it right. seems like that happens, right, right. you know, frequently from, right. from the folks, good folks over there that are very busy processing 50,000 applications. So, so how would you approach that explicitly? Um, with the, start at the SRO, start with you, start with the SRO at the other, at the study section you want well, to send it to, exactly right, how, right. how would you go about this? So, uh, first of all, when you send in the application, there's a form you can actually request or suggest, suggest a study section. And CSR does look at those requests, suggestions, whatever, and try to honor them if they make sense, okay? So that's first preemptively before it even comes in the door, you can, you can try that. Now, if it does come in and it gets to, it goes to a study section you don't think is really the proper one, first of all, do your homework, look up that study section, look at its, you know, its uh, charge, and uh, look at the roster, you know, make sure you're right that it's not the best place. And, and then, yes, you know, you'd contact the SRO for the one where it's assigned right now and have just start the discussion. You know, you don't have to be inflammatory, but just say, you know, I'm kind of confused. Um, could you explain? <laughs> you know. uh, and, and honestly, SROs want, by and large, want you to be happy with the, where it's getting reviewed. Again, if it makes sense and it's, you know, the, the scientific expertise is there. Because if you're not happy with it, darn, if that summary statement comes back and you get a bad score, it's because it went to the wrong study section, right? So, so as much as they can, if, the, if your recommendation or suggestion uh, scientifically makes sense, they try to abide by that. But yeah, call the SRO, start the discussion. Okay, very good, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you both so much for great talks. Um, uh, Allison, this is actually something I think I've asked you before, but I thought it'd be instructive. So if you already get a grant from a certain institute, like NIGMS, to what extent do you tend to stay in that institute in your subsequent applications, and in particular when there's a funding announcement that's sponsored by, say, other institutes, like how much can you move between institutes? And, and does an institute have an incentive to sort of keep you <laughs> and, and fund you later? Oh, and it gets worse than that. There's specific program directors within the institute who want to keep certain investigators. No, it, it's, it's, about, it's driven by the science. And it's not uncommon, I mean, especially GM being, you know, a lot of what we support is, is very basic research in addition to our clinical areas. So often people will start with us, but then, you know, they find something about their basic science that actually has an application to the eye or to the elderly, and since suddenly they have an application, you know, to send someone else. You know, and that's fine. I mean, we, we, we actually, you know, encourage that. Um, I mean, NIGMS does, I would say over the last several years, is very conscious about total other support. You guys at this stage, you're not worried about that. You're worried about getting your first grant. But um, just, just you know, we're trying, I think, to take limited resources and spread them around as, as far as we can to improve success rates. And so, you know, we do, for established investigators, really keep an eye on the other support. And that, you know, includes grants to other institutes and other agencies as well. But you all don't have to worry about that yet. 
maybe one more question? We do have one more question. Um, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. I have a question that um, I think pertains to a lot of young people. I, you know, I review grants uh, for some of the foundations as well as for SAT. And that is, uh, Emery in particular mentioned the importance of getting training, uh, you know, and, and new skills. But a lot of young people are now doing, you know, team-based science. And some of those skills are very difficult to acquire. I'll give, you know, the example of machine learning would be a, a good one, or, or high-level statistical analysis. How critical is it for the newbie PI or the up-and-coming ambitious PI to have that skill, have mastery of that skill on their own versus collaborate with somebody who can bring that skill in and add another key personnel to their grant? Yeah. I, I think it's a really good question because, uh, and, and I, think it's, it, I think it's a normative decision. I think you have to decide where do you want your expertise to lie going forward. So if you say like, oh, I've become totally enamored of machine learning and I really want to build a career, you know, doing the sorts of things like, you know, Jeff Balzer was talking about today, then, you know, getting a master's, maybe even getting a PhD, that's, I think, very, very reasonable to do. However, if you've decided that, you know, you're going to be the maven for understanding what factors predict um, perioperative risk for patients having anesthesia and surgery, and you realize that you have the insights of what the main things are, then there, getting some basic training in machine learning, and then getting the machine learning unit at you know, your institute or collaborators, I think is really the way to do. The compelling thing in a grant is that you have to make clear that all the expertise you need is covered. And if you say, if I don't have it, he does or she does. And I think once you do that, and it's very clear, oh, everything is layered out, you're, you're totally good. I think that the key thing, though, is that the reason I mentioned the new training is that you say, oh, you know, I'm going to turn the corner. I'm going to start becoming a clinician scientist now. And you use, because that's where I see myself over the next 10, 15 years, you know, going. And so then that's, then there I think you really want to consider training, training deeply. Well, thank you very much.